Hi, everyone. I am Sarah Wright Olson. <laughs> and I'm Teresa Palmer. And, and you are you... listening to The Mother Days. Ah! And there's someone laughing in the background. <laughs> it's a male voice. How it dare. sounds familiar. How dare. This is not a solo episode today, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we have someone here who is very familiar to both of our families. Um, we are really excited to welcome a guy who not only is an actor, producer, a father, um, an amazing husband. <laughs> 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 Teresa, give me more. Give me tell us more wonderful. Sarah love knows to hear him it. Love- <laughs> inside out, uh, back to front, all the ways. And he's decided to come and join us today. His name is Eric Christian, Christian Olsen. Olsen. Woo, woo, woo. Put it up, put it up, up, Watching up. your wife um, introduce you we is love him. by far the highlight thus far. Why are we both <laughs> dancing? We're both like doing these weird body rolls. Like, yeah. I don't know. I, I think from happiness, we're excited. I think so. Listen, nothing kinder than a, a body roll introduction. Can I just read this text message from... <laughs> Eric, Wyatt drained my AirPods. I'm going to raw dog the air. (laughs) What is that? I'm going to raw dog the air? (laughs) No, you've never heard the term raw dog? It's like, it's like. No. This is such a solid start. Raw dog is essentially sex without protection. And so during COVID, if you didn't have a mask, you were out there just raw dog in the air. You've never heard this? Raw oh dog God. the air. No, is this an American saying? Today I was saying to my American girlfriends, like, oh, I'm going to come in and have a bevy in the Arvo. Like, a, um, What's bevy in the Arvo mean? I was like, how, do you, how does, like, none of us know what that means? Bevy in the Arvo means, like, having a beverage in the afternoon. I was like, I'm going to arrive early and I'm so down, can't wait to have a bevy in the Arvo. And they're all like, what? There's like seven Americans being like, what the hell? I had to Google all of these words. <laughs> they are strange. I'm like, yes, they're Australian. I love it. I changed to my my raw dog's uh, air. And this is all usable. Raw dog. I thought that that was a typo. I was like, <gasps> what is raw dog the air? No, it was just a, it's such a like a frat boy. He's just like, I didn't have a condom and I raw dogged it. And then when COVID oh happened goodness. and people would go outside without a mask and they were just raw dogging the air, I thought it was the perfect- Raw dog the air. Without a mask. So you're literally just out there oh breathing gosh. all the things. So then I'm always raw dogging every time I have sex. I, we're raw dogging? Well, you're, yeah. you're married, so there isn't as much uh, risk with the raw dogging <laughs> with one's with raw... uh, uh, spouse. Mm, you know I can't I mean? have any more babies though. I can't, I'm too afraid. I'm... I thought you were having eight. I can't have any for three years because did Sarah tell you next year is our manifest year? Oh yeah, I didn't. I didn't get into all the details. Of no, it. I just heard you wanted to have eight kids. I didn't know there was a timestamp <laughs> on it. Well, actually, the tarot card reader, oh, who is our amazing friend Angie Banneke, she told oh, us God. that we ha- both Sarah and I have to focus on our work. <laughs> so I can't have any more babies for a few years, especially not in my manifest year, not next year. We're planting the seeds right now, Sarah. I don't know. She told me end of November. It's my choice. Is it the end of this November or the end of next November? (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, that's crazy because that's the only time that I can get pregnant. That's the end of November. That's when we have most of our kids, right? Is it November? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a real, real saucy time in the old household. Nothing says love in the air like Thanksgiving. Just lots of. <laughs> we are so thankful <laughs> during Thanksgiving. I love that you're dictating the logistics of your future based on a woman flipping over cards. I'm just going to put that out there. But we're not. But that's just the thing is that we're not. And I we talked about this before is that. Yeah, but we've never talked about it on air. So I thought it was a wonderful time to. True. Yeah. No, no, no. Not you and I. I'm saying Teresa and I actually oh. talked about this before. You're not fully dictating your life by it. It's just kind of like. A guide. Yeah. It's like a little something. Something that's like put out there and you can take it or leave it, right? It's like with it, any information. So there's some people I think that Where probably- Where do you stand on all this, Eric? Uh, right. I want to hear this because <laughs> this is what's interesting to me is when there's like a part, like a couple mm-hmm. and one of them is like open and believes in these things and maybe there's life after death and maybe there's spirits and manifesting all that. And then there's the other one that's like, it's all bullshit. 
Where do you stand? <laughs> I'm definitely not that. First off, that was a lot of topics to unpack very quickly. <laughs> yeah, he went yeah, straight yeah, into yeah. religion and afterlife. Uh, I do believe as a blanket statement for so many things in life that things have power because we give them power. So if you believe in something, then that power from you makes those things um, happen. I mean, I don't know if it's happened, but I think that people that works both positively and negatively. Um, so I think that's I that's the part that. where I think it's I would never use the word dangerous, but I think that when it could be it honestly, it could be. I think that's the thing about Angie, though, Eric, that um, she's super positive. She only goes to the light. Like everything mm -hmm. is about positivity. Like she talks about the way that she reads people or like reads these cards or interpretations or whatever it is, however she gets it, right? Because we were asking, I was asking her questions as if I'd never heard of this ever before in my life because I was like, I didn't grow up with this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so she talks about the information that she receives. She, she goes, there's always two ways that you can go with it. I could see a card that is like, you know, this card that could be like all this negativity, but instead I, there's a positive that you can go a positive route with it where you're like, okay, so maybe you were feeling all these things in your life or doing all this in your life. And now like, this is your moment to pivot and like, take, take this moment and like push forward and everything is just positive. And so instead of um, being like, well, it looks like, you know, I'm not really seeing anything past next year because you're probably going to die. <laughs> it's like, and then you're like, oh my God, I'm going to die next year. I'm going to die. <laughs> it's like, there's I know something every time, because I was in person with her, she was flipping the cards over and I kept getting this card of a person who seemingly was dead since I had eight <laughs> swords stabbing into their body. I was like, is that an okay card to get? Like I, every time I kept Wait, what was that impersonation like, of her? Ooh. You just, just like, Ew. it was it. It was a voice that comes out sometimes when I'm looking for a character. <laughs> what it is. But this is my Strong. insecure voice. It comes out like that. Yeah, where like my boy, my throat closes over with fear. But I saw the card many times. Swords to the stomach. Terrifying. I was like, what does this mean? But she mm -hmm. was saying like new beginnings that we are, uh, I think, are breaking, unpacking and breaking down some of my blockages. I was like. I like that perspective. That That is a good way to break this down. If anything, Thank it's you. like a motiv motivational speaker that's like yes. motivating you towards, does that make sense? So that I fully digest because I think that anything that serves as a catalyst for like forward progress in life and, yes. and going after the things you love. I told Sarah this story yesterday. I just heard it and so it's fresh in my head, but it's the story of that kid that it was his junior year uh, and his mom, he was like failing out of school um, and his mom begged him, please just take the SATs. He was like, I'm not taking the SATs. I'm not going to college. And she was like, just do this thing for me. She signed him up. He was like, fine. Went, took the SATs, got his score back and he got a 1460. And this was a time in which the top was 1600. 1460 was a really high score and showed that he was, you know, not off the charts with intelligence, but carried a lot of intellectual power. He uh, took that as a catalyst to double down, start going to class, started studying because he realized he had this amazing brain, got into college, graduated college, went on to start this incredibly successful magazine, and at some point in time discovered a letter from the SAT, the people that do the SATs, apologizing for mix-ups in scores. He actually got a 740. What? Yeah, and the only difference is so literally double what he actually got. So in that moment, this person, which was not a person, this piece of paper served as a catalyst for him to say like, oh, I have this special thing. Nothing changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His brain didn't mm -hmm. change, but someone gave him a piece of information that allowed him to say, oh, I'm capable of great things. And then what, of course, did he do was great things. And that's actually that inspired action that we were talking about with Stephanie yeah. Keith. Yeah, exactly. Love it's that. like, it's like, po it's, the, it's taking this, this positive thing and giving it energy and like, it's. It's amazing that optimism um, driving you and pushing it you forward. You. Yeah, it can fuel Absolutely. you. And that's really healthy. Yeah, mm -hmm. very healthy. Um, this is our very first daddy episode. I'm oh, really excited to have, um, well, the daddy in my life <laughs> here today. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm excited to get some dad perspective on some things. So um, thanks for doing the show, Eric. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I wrote some questions. What? Did I, you really? I wrote some questions. Look at your prep. I wrote some. Only a few. Only a couple. Um, 
I wanted to know some things mm-hmm. about you guys. Great. Um, look, I think when we look at the Olsen family from Instagram, we get a certain perspective. <laughs> it's the highlight reel. It's beautiful. I mean, you guys are so ridiculously pretty. It's unbelievable. Like, just, like, aesthetically, we're going to get shallow here. You're both beautiful. And then you have these gorgeous children and you're just glamorous and cool and you're kicking goals and you absolutely (laughs) are. You are. You're glam. You look beautiful. You have these incredible lives. You travel. You work. You Tell me about this. So we see these little snippets and I want to know, like, how – What's it really like? Give us the raw. Give us the stuff beneath that because I know, I'm, I bear witness to it, it's actually true. Like you do live authentically in this joy and you have, there's such a, a beauty to your lives in every definition of that word. And I want to know like how do you do it? Was it always like that? And when it's not like that, like how do you get through it? Do you want to take that question? No, it's for you. You're the guest, you goofball. Yeah, but it was a, <laughs> it was about both of us. I uh, know. You're going to start. The, you're the guest. Welcome to the show. Get after <laughs> it. <laughs> that was such a Jason Bateman uh, question. There was like 75 parts to it. That's what I do. That's what I do. I, I think the first part of the question is, is the Instagram version of our life the same version that we live on a regular basis? Yeah. Yeah. I, I Listen, I think that, We've all read the studies on Instagram and how kind of dangerous that is for mental health for people. And I think so much of that is the comparison of lifestyles and the fact that people really do highlight reels, um, which makes anything kind of seem unattainable. And therefore, we see the chemical reaction to watching other people live the best version of their lives versus the reality of ours. So I think we do a, a pretty honest and authentic job of kind of the highs and the lows, but so much of our collective perspective is that that life is spectacular but fleeting and we've you know both seen a lot of loss in our life and so i think that we have anchored and we just had this conversation literally yesterday while i was in the shower anchored sadness um in some of those losses but therefore because of that you really get to enjoy and celebrate those highs and it makes everything um, and this is a philosophy that goes all the way back to my dad, but you celebrate the little things as well. And if you find yourself mm-hmm. celebrating the little things consistently, that's just a really kind of wonderful way to, to explore life. Um, so I, I think that the Instagram version of it, I think we're both really honest about um, kind of how we approach the world and approach each other. And I think that we both agree that the highlight of our lives is these children and the adventures we get to go on. You know, I think about um, how lucky we are that we get to do those things, that we all have the opportunity to do jobs that we love and that we're grateful for that. Like, you know, we got to go to Spain with you um, and Mark and and at that point, four kids. Can we do that again? Yes, we can. But what a special, crazy, (laughs) like, oh, we're just going to go on Airbnb and it was like, how's this place? You were like, great. I was like, I don't know how to get there. We're just going to book it. Done. I mean, I, there's just so there's just so much. But, but but on top of that, which is like truly a highlight reel, there's also like, you know, Wyatt saying, I want to go to Costco with you. And just the two of us going to Costco to return a, uh, a Dyson. I love those. I love a Target run. Yeah. Love it. Mm-hmm. Taking Poet. She sits in the little trolley. That's another Australian word, isn't it? Shopping cart. <laughs> Uh, and then we we walk around the the trolley sounds really fancy like it sounds like you're gonna need to get a ticket and there's gonna be bells and you're gonna be like riding through town yeah you're really selling it with the trolley that's the the trolley it's just a shopping cart with syphilis on it you're gonna raw dog (laughs) shopping cart I know. Well, you guys probably have your little, what, you always have those antiseptic wipes and they're like, uh, what's the brand here that you use for your like antibacterial? It's, called, um, e, it's like EO? EO or something. Yeah, I it's always like a... see it at your house. You have like a million of them everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you would be sanitizing the shit the, out of that was, trolley. You guys, this is way before yeah, COVID. I Eric say. and I, I have, have always like sprayed everything down. My brother, yes. lo- he rode with, my brother rode with me on an airplane one time 
time. And I was like spraying the seat and spraying the window and spraying everything to like, you know, it's lavender essential oil spray. And I'm like spraying it all down. And my brother turns around and he was like, you're the reason for the super germ. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's not wrong. Well, except for the fact that like, we wrong. don't take the <laughs> antibiotics, but you're definitely right about. I mean, because you're taking out the good germs as well. I want all the oh, good germs. God. I just don't want the hepatitis A through C, <laughs> and I don't want the uh, parvo for the dogs. I don't want the. Uh. But yeah, that's a fine balance. But I don't. That, I don't know if that answers that question. That's a beautiful answer, and I want to know: Has it? I know like in when you were first together, when you were first like creating this union and you knew that you wanted to be together, were there some specific hurdles that were, you know, these reoccurring themes in your dynamic that would come up for you guys? And if so, like how did you work through that and how did you evolve to get to the place where you are now as two people who are beautiful communicators and you're, I just always look at your marriage and I think, you figured out the balance of being such good friends and such comrades, but you're also madly in love. Tell me about just that evolution. Ooh, it's it's actually been a long journey, uh, <laughs> and and I'm I say that because um, it didn't start out like all you know peas and carrots, as they say. It it was who says who says I, well, I was like what is I that guess peas and People from where I grew up, because, you know, peas and carrots <laughs> go together. Oh, I get it. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, like in a can, you know, like there's like a can, nope. there's like a can oh, of like yeah, peas and carrots. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, Ew, like, they, that sounds they go disgusting. Together. But yeah, They're like the, the can of food, you pour it into the pot and you heat it up, and that's dinner, right? So, that's <laughs> the peas and carrots. Sad window into your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my dad was he was a, a, a ever learning cook became a really great cook as an adult um yeah so you know when we first started dating um I had a really tough time communicating in conflict and it's still something to this day that I I struggle with but um Eric has actually uh developed a, la a like a love language with me to make me feel safe oh my god am I gonna cry <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> Um, this is really sweet. But, you know, when we were first starting out, I was like 22 years old. I just gotten out of a, a, you know, relationship. I was married before. I just got a divorce and um, I had a terrible communication with my past relationship. And so, you know, when we were dating, I would, we would, conflict would arise. Like Eric was one of those people that, you know, if I would try to skirt around something or he was always bringing it to the top, he was like, no, we're going to have this conversation. And I would get hot. I would get sweaty. I'd want to run away. Like I'd literally run from like one end of our small apartment to the other and <laughs> <laughs> like go hide by the door for a minute to like have a beat. And he'd be like, where are you going? Like, what are you doing? Like, don't run away from from this, you know, and I just didn't, I didn't know how to sit in the conflict. I just always felt like everything was going to fall apart. And, mm. um, and I was scared to lose him, to lose what we had. Like I'd never, ever experienced, um, a love like I felt with him and it was just so electric. And so anything that started to rock it or shake it in some way, it, it was terrifying to me. And I mm -hmm. was like grasping at, at, at anything that I could. And he would constantly pull me back and say like, okay, s stop. Whatever all of this is, you, you got to stop reaching for these things. Just look at me. Be honest. Let's be in this moment, be in this conflict. And he didn't always have such clear words. Like it took us a long time to, and he can speak to his, <laughs> his words on that. It took us a long time to get to that point. But I will say that, you know, it's been almost, I think, 16 and a half years or something that we've been together. We This year, we're celebrating 10 years of marriage. Wow. Um, the last few years of our relationship and even like the time during COVID, I feel like we were so deeply um, immersed into our family and then we were sitting in our communication big time. It's not like we could just like run off to work or whatever, you know, yeah. it's like, we, when anything would come up, like we really had to speak. And with every pregnancy, with the losses that have happened in our lives, when I lost my dad, so many big conversations have come up for us. And um, in those conversations, I think with everything that has arisen in our lives, 
I personally have seen myself, our relationship, and him grow in that because instead of running away and going and hiding in the corner like I want to. Which is that, would you say that resistance came from your, just the way that you were, yeah, yeah, I think like the way that that I was brought up. You know, I, I grew up with two unbelievable human beings who did nothing but show me love. They were Mm -hmm. amazing. And, but they were children. They were children having children. Mm -hmm. They were like 20 years old and we kind of were growing up together. And so, you know, sometimes the, the thing when conflict would arise, the conflict would get like pushed underneath the rug and we wouldn't really talk about that. And so then that became a part of your conditioning. It was my conditioning. And, and Mm -hmm. I, I was a pastor's kid. I had to live my life like presenting someone who had it together, who didn't make mistakes, um, who, you know, like when, if there was something that came up, it's like, oh, no, 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 I I would never do that. But of course, like, I remember thinking as a child, gosh, like every time that you sin, you need to repent for your sins. And God's always listening and always watching. And you guys, I read the Bible like so many times. I was in Bible schools and camps and like all the things, the very, very, very indoctrinated into the Southern Baptist religion. And so for me, it was like making a mistake meant that I needed to repent. It was a huge deal. So even if I thought of a cuss word, like I needed to go to God about it, right? So Mm -hmm. my entire childhood was like I needed to be perfect because not only was I under God and under this banner of, of heaven, and it was also under my dad who was the pastor. And so mm-hmm. he was this, I put him way up on this pedestal for me and I love, loved him dearly. Um, but at the same time, I was afraid to show him the ugliness inside of me. And, right. and then that manifested itself in your romantic relationships. Yeah, for me- There was not I- ugliness inside you. No, no, no. I, I, but I know that what you, okay, so what I mean by the ugliness inside of me is just like anything inside of me that wasn't what somebody else would consider to be like, okay, there's this perfect picture, but mm-hmm. like you Acceptable. are going to have feelings that are not, that like doesn't feel good. And you're going to have like moments where in life where you're, um, you've made mistakes and it feels yucky and like sitting in those mistakes and that shame, like it's hard for me to this day. If I forget to write somebody back, like this happened to us the other day, I didn't write somebody back for a whole week. And you guys, it weighed on me like crazy. I had to talk myself down from it. I had to like forgive myself for it. I had to like, okay, what's my pivot here? I saw it happening in real time. I saw the look down at the phone. I saw the like ashen. I went completely white. And then she just wanted to keep talking about and processing it. And I was like, it's okay. Like everyone <laughs> understands. We're all really busy. The amount of people I've done that to. Whoops, sorry uh, guys if you're listening. But um, <laughs> yeah, but it makes sense that this is where it's come from. Um, and you know, I had a similar religious upbringing too. And yes. you know, I, t- it took me so many years. In fact, I had to go to therapy to unpack um, just what that narrative was for me and how it shows up in my life and especially in my romantic relationships. I think for me, that's where I was like, whoa, that came from some really young places. Um, so that's, yeah. thank you for being so open about that. Um, Eric, how do you feel when she's, do you, like, what do you think when she's explaining this and describing that early part of your relationship? I, I mean, listen, I had my own shit to unpack, which is that I'd never lived up until that point, you know, I lived selfishly. I think that you get to do that as a guy, you know, in your early 20s living in Los Angeles on a TV show. So I had my own shit. And I remember like at one point, you know, in one of these discussions early on, and I I always kind of had the ability to say of something that was I knew was hurtful, um, and mm-hmm. I said it. Same. Um, just because you know your mind's that quick, and at that point, I felt the need to like make this hurt, and I did. And she goes, "You don't get to talk to me like that." And I remember just being like, "Oh, I remember where we were. We were like behind a house, like in a parking lot." And she's like, "You don't get to talk to me like that." Wow. And I was just like, "Oh, um, okay, um, you're right." Um, and that being like those pivotal moments where like, this is not coming from a place of love. So, you know, as much as, listen, this is a conversation I have with my kids all the time, which is just, 
you have to have the fearlessness to live your authentic life. Um, and cowards lie because they can't do that. The reason people lie mm -hmm. is they're afraid to be the version of themselves that did whatever it is that they did. And I think there's a big difference between the choices that we make and who we are inside. And so I say all the time, like, we can make bad decisions and we can make choices that were um, coming from fear or coming from shame. But those are just choices. And so all we do in that moment is we say, all right, I did this thing. Um, I shouldn't have done it. And here's the pivot. And here's how I don't do it next time. So it, it separates you and the core of who you mm -hmm. are from the choices that you make. You're not finding identity in your choices. You're finding them in, in who your heart is. And such real growth comes from that. Yeah, because it allows you to very quickly change and adapt. Um, and I think that, you know, whether it's something smaller, whether it's something big, your ability to be like, that was a bad decision. It's also not who I am. Therefore, I'm not going to do it again. But I'm not going to beat myself up about it because I know that at the core of who I am, that that's not a fair representation of of, of me. Um, mm. So it's it. I, can I just say something really quick? And for anybody else who struggles with that, <laughs> it is something that it does, it's not, does, isn't necessarily going to go away overnight. And it definitely hasn't no. for me. Like I still struggle with it on a daily basis. And that's where the love language comes in, where Eric, you know, during like COVID when we were at home and I think I was pregnant and I don't even remember what we were talking about, but I remember what you said to me and you'd asked me something and I started to, I started to panic like in my, because I knew that whatever it was that I was about to say, it was like, I wasn't sure how to get it out. And I, I wanted to tell you because that would be authentic, but like, I didn't want to lie. And so I was just starting to struggle to like, be honest with you about something. And you looked at me for maybe the first time in our relationship, very calmly and lovingly. And you said, it's okay. I love you. It's okay. If it's a yes, it's okay. If it's a no, it doesn't matter. I want you to know it doesn't matter, but like whatever's happening right now, take a breath and it's okay. And just tell me the truth. Mm. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I could, that is the exact, <laughs> I, I'm going to cry. <laughs> that is the exact sentence that I need <clears throat> in a relationship because I cannot control all the fear that comes up inside of me. Mm -hmm. And I try to, I try to, like, I, I'll grasp at straws. I'll do everything I can. I try to work through the things. I do not operate a, as fast paced in my brain as, as other people do. When, you know, something comes up, I immediately go to like the, no, 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 I can't be that person. I, no, I can't say yes. This is going to disappoint this person. And you made it so safe that I just like took a breath. And I was like, oh, he's not, it's not, this isn't going to hurt anything. It's just the truth. And I was like, yes, I did not do whatever this was. I'm sorry. And you were like, amazing. Thank you. Okay. And then we moved on and I was like, what? <laughs> it was it just sounds like amazing that you guys really are able to show up and be each other's emotional regulators when you need, when that a need rises he can come in and help you. He sees you, he observes you. Did that take for you in that moment, Eric? Was there any sort of, um, was there a specific softening to get to that place or it was just your heart led and took you there and you, oh, actually what she needs right now, it's not about what she says, it's she just needs to feel loved. Yeah, that's definitely something that, um that I had to work on too, which is just the end result is if, if the end result is not letting self-preservation rule how we communicate, right? Which is what so much of us do. And that self-preservation mm -hmm. that served us for 10,000 years, like it's not just your upbringing. It's like who we are as, as reptiles. Um, so that instinct to just be like, I want to present the best version of myself. I don't want to look like the person that did whatever this is. Um, if I just want honesty and then the ability to be your partner, and this, this is true in relationships, this is true in work, this is true in friendships. If that's my mm -hmm. end goal, then I have to approach it with more love because the, the original way that I would, would be just like a lawyer being like, I was just going to mm -hmm. say you were a lawyer so quick. And the cross examination, too. just like, I know where we're headed. So the faster we get there 
And that's not the way to get it. I'd still get the Same. answer, but there, the, play, the, the damage that was done in a cross-examination to get to that place served no purpose because it made the other person 100%. more frightened. Um, and it also made me so sad because it, 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 it forced me to be the person that got the truth versus someone that can reveal it on their own and have the courage to do so. That's a really beautiful observation. And I think when the four of us have been together with Mark, Mark and Sarah really connect on some of <laughs> so how much. they like to communicate. And Eric and I are really similar too. Like Mark always says, like, you lawyer up. Like I get my, I get my evidence. I get every, I go boom, boom, boom. I get all the same things, cross-examine uh, until I'm right, until my point is across. And I always feel so like self-righteous in those moments. So I think one of my big life lessons in the last, I'd say 18 months, I've really been looking at um, just softening, meeting him from a soft, loving, gentle place without the defensiveness. I come in and I get defensive. Um, and I, now it doesn't matter. If I, I can, inside of me, I can feel like, oh, I'm definitely right in this moment. But actually, it's not about that. It's about like, how do we have each other's user manual? What is, how can I meet this need within him? And how can he meet my need? And sometimes it's just like, oof, that felt crazy. Like we had so many big feelings. And the same way we communicate with our kids, like all those feelings are okay. Like kids, it's fine for you to show up and have these big moments and of erratic emotions, but they just need to feel like they have a safe, soft place to land. And our partners need it also. Um, so I'm always like, oh, speak to the inner child. I've got to speak to the inner child. Um, so it's funny listening to this and how you guys have got there. It seems like what a beautiful journey. And I have to say, just as your friend, um, your relationship uh, seems to be in such a connected, soulful place and uh i feel that even from afar <laughs> because of covid <laughs> and not seeing you guys very often but just um your way with one another is really beautiful and unique so i hope that people listening can see that it, it doesn't start there that's a it's a journey and it's a, a continuous journey it's gonna keep happening i think that's a really good point and should be reiterated that this was i mean especially the first couple of years of the relationship it was a lot of a lot of work from both of us. Um, and if you just centered that work on love and not self-preservation, which both of us had to do, that's the only way I think that we kept navigating it. I remember one time you were talking, before we were like really dating, we were, well, we were just started dating. No, it was our first year. It was our first year together. We had a lot of big fights. And I remember you telling a friend of mine, and then she relayed this to me, but she, but you had said to her like, I know, I know she's worth it. I know this is worth it. Like this relationship is worth it. And I'm going to keep fighting for her. And, um, and I, I literally felt inside of me always like, you know, in that first year, like, wow, this is so hard. Like, this is really hard. We we're having a really hard time communicating with each other, but we just kept pushing through because we both felt I, that it was, like worth it. We loved each other. The love was crazy. <laughs> so it was just that we had a really hard time communicating and we came from very different places in communication at the beginning. Like I had no tools <laughs> to communicate. <laughs> and so for you guys, um, I know that there have been some really, um, really challenging, emotionally challenging moments in your relationship. And I know uh, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because in the last few days, you have had to do a deep dive back into your well of tools to help navigate grief because you've lost someone very close to your family. Um, and this isn't the first time you've had to do the grief dance. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that and how you show up for each other and what it feels like now being in grief as opposed to what that looked like a number of years ago when you were pregnant with Esme and you lost your father. Um, well, I so appreciate this question because um, because throughout my whole life, you know, my dad was a minister, as I said, and he 
he actually like preached at a lot of funerals. He was the one who did the services. So I have been going to funerals for family members, for church members, for people um, in our lives, my whole life. So I've actually dealt with a lot of grief um, through that and found my own little like tool, you know, ways of like dealing with things. But being presented with my dad was dying when Esme was in my belly um, as my second child, when I started to realize that like he's not going to make it and he is going to die, like the next few months are probably the last months of his life and he won't make it to August when she's going to be born, then I think that my, um, because it was someone so close to me, it took me to like a different level of um, pain inside and uh, in and just, it was like a slow burn of of like a little release every day of like a little bit more sadness like how is it going to feel tomorrow how is it going to feel and then once you know he passed away it w- it hit so hard and um when when i was with him taking care of him and being pregnant with esme i realized really quickly that this was much bigger than anything that i could handle on my own so I started speaking to um, a therapist because I started to talk to my friends about it and they were so supportive and wonderful. And I was talking to Eric about it, but then I realized like I'm, I'm bringing, there's so much that I need to bring up, but I'm a little bit like, I'm, I'm just, a, I'm like pulling back a little bit because it's so heavy. And I also don't, I don't necessarily want to, I didn't want to put all the heaviness on all the people that I loved in my life because I also needed them to like, show up and support my friends and my my kids and my husband and like all of us and our family and what we're going through. And so it just felt too much. And so I reached out to a therapist, um, Dr. Alyssa Berlin, who is, you know, we've talked about Dr. Berlin a lot, um, Dr. Elliot Berlin, who's our amazing prenatal chiropractor and postpartum. And he, um, his wife is a therapist. And so I started talking to her And, um, you know, I talk about those sessions with her. It's not like, it's not like she gave me this like golden toolkit of things to do. It was, she held space for me and I sat in her office and sobbed my eyes out and talked about all the things I was feeling, like everything from, I'm having all these flashes of my childhood and this person who was so important to me. Like, I feel like those things are going to be pulled away from me or I feel like, you know, I've lost, I'm, I'm losing someone or I'm about to lose someone and I'm carrying this baby inside my belly and um, how is that going to affect the baby and how do I not put all of those emotions into her, you know, and like what's happening? How do I separate the two? And so um, I sat there and I cried in her office over and over again, but that release was so important. I needed it so bad. Um, I needed to go and do that and then get on a plane and dry, and fly right back to my dad, be by his side, sleep on an air mattress next to him, hold his hand, listen to his breath, sing to him. You were pregnant with Esme this whole time. And I was pregnant with Esme the whole time. Um, and he died. I was about five months pregnant and, um, and I wrote the eulogy for his memorial and carried his ashes to Louisville and... Um, said goodbye to him and through all of this processed it with a therapist, with my family, with my friends. Um, It was heavy. And I had a lot of big conversations with Eric about uh, what it felt like, what I was going through, like how I was, you know, a lot of my friends were like, how are you doing this? Like, how do you, how are you managing your dad dying and you're pregnant? And I was like, honestly, it's, I just had to go and go to therapy and talk to someone about it. Because um, that gave me the strength to to really talk about the stuff that I was feeling deep, deep inside, and then release it, let it go, and and keep pushing forward. Um, and so, what Teresa was talking about um, about recently in the last couple of days is that we lost um, our doctor, our OBGYN, Dr. Goldberg. And uh, he's so much more than that title. I know. (laughs) And so um, it it sounds like if you haven't had a a baby yet, um, having this person that you're giving birth with that's on your birth team that you love so deeply, the bond is crazy. Mm -hmm. It's like – and he was one of those people that made you feel like you were – 
the only patient and also his favorite patient. And just like, <laughs> you know, he, he, just so, he was so special um, in a lot of ways. And I also really felt like he understood my body and the way that like I have these big babies and my cervix doesn't fully dilate. And he like, he specifically knows what to do. And it's like, he can read my mind when I'm in birth. And, um, and, and because of that, I feel connected to him forever, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, he tragically died. Uh, it was a shock. Yeah, it was a shock. And and he's young and he's healthy and he's amazing. He's like a superstar. I mean, they were, you know, we I just mm -hmm. went to his memorial and they, everyone was talking about he, he was he was the person that everybody looked up to. Yeah. Um and so we've had a lot of big conversations, Eric, if you want to talk about um about grief in the last like few days and and talking to our kids about it and being open like when mommy's crying, when daddy's crying, like having conversations about the why and, you know, the bigger conversation about being in the great beyond or whatever you call it, heaven, the universe, like um, just being really open. And also I think um, death and because I was talking about Dr. Goldberg, um, to, cause he was also my doctor, but I, I didn't birth with him. He did uh, perform my DNC when I lost my uh, second pregnancy. And then he really nurtured me the last two pregnancies through a lot of the health issues I had um, during pregnancy with Prairie and Poet with um, the antigen and having an isoimmunization pregnancy. It's a very delicate kind of pregnancy. And I would email him at the most random times of night because I would be in Australia being like, oh my gosh, I just got this scan and I'm not sure about this. And he would show up and also with always such a sense of humor he always helped make things feel lighter. Even if mm -hmm. we were carrying the burden of a, a heavy situation, he found a way to lighten things and make us just feel less panicked or less stressed. And because I've been talking to Sarah a lot about Dr. Goldberg and um, my son Bodhi was overhearing some of these conversations and he was like, well, how did he die? How? How did it happen? I was like, well, you know, it, it was his time. It was his time to go and he died doing something he loved doing and he was, you know, riding his bike and, and Brody's like, but well, what about if you're doing something that you love doing? Like what if, you know, when you go horse riding or what if you like go and do the movie or mom, what about <laughs> Forrest? It's like, well, you know, when you go, because I'm going to Palm Springs this weekend, Forest is like, well, so does that mean you could die going to Palm Springs for the night? And I was like, well, <laughs> um, and it's such a challenging conversation to have to have with your children. And I tend to say there's those possibilities do exist because anything is possible in this world, but um, it's not something we ever have to think about. And what we need to think about is presence and what we have now and how we have each other. And I feel like my cheat way of getting out of this is saying like, oh, don't worry. Like, I, I'm i sure we're all going to be old wrinkly grannies and grandpas in our bed and we're going to die peacefully in our sleep with the surrounded by the people that we love. And that seems to help relieve their fear, but also... I feel like it's a lie because I don't know. <laughs> As somebody who does like so believes in just telling our kids the truth, I think in that situation, it's the same thing I do, which is if we, if they have to live with the fear that we could die at any minute, like that's, I think, too much to carry. So mm -hmm. I, I say the same thing. I say two things. I say like, you know, I think, you know, your mom and I are going to be around to watch your kids and your kids' kids. And if that ends up being a lie, that's a lie. And we can deal with that when, when that time comes. Mm -hmm. But I also say all the time, when I'm not with you, where am I? And, and they all say, they both say in my heart and in my head. And I say, and what's the memory you think about in your heart? And what's the memory you think about in your head? And Esme is really cute because she, she says for her head, uh, she, when she was quarantined for when we thought that she was going to get COVID, I took her out to Malibu for five days. and It was just the two of us. So every morning I'd get up and I'd make her her five breakfasts because she eats just five breakfasts in a row. <laughs> and then we'd work out together and then we'd watch Mandalorian together. And then every day we'd take these 
uh, hikes on the beach to the rock, which is like a mile away down from where we have that trailer. And, um, and so that's what's in her head. And I said, what's in your heart? And she goes, the feeling like we would sit on this little chair that's like perched on this rock and she would just snuggle in my lap and we would eat our snack because we'd always bring a snack because again, she has to eat. Um, and my hope <laughs> is that if do something tragic does happen, that they can carry mm -hmm. that feeling and that memory after we're gone and not, I mean, that's, that is literally my greatest fear mm. is that we're not around to watch these kids become, you know, the creatures Ugh. they are. That is my greatest fear. Same. Um, and I'm not, and it's something I'm not great at. Um, and as Sarah knows, cause we had this conversation again, you know, Guys, my boobs are milking right now from emotion. <laughs> I'm not I'm not feeling myself up. I really am trying to stop the milk from pouring out. <laughs> oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> that you know, loss is we're not good. Norwegians and Australians, I don't think we're good at, at grief or sadness. I made a sweeping generalization about Australians, but I'm just assuming based on their heart <laughs> But Norwegians, like I remember like giving my grandpa a hug when I was little and my grandpa is like legendary. The guy is such a hero. He has this whole um, center named after him. He was a teacher and then a, um, um, a principal at a school, just like just the pillar of humanity as far as how he viewed the world and all the complexities of that time in Minnesota. But I gave him a hug and I was like, I love you, grandpa. And he was like, Oh, well, I feel the same way about you. Like just kind of patting my back because he didn't even know how to hug. Oh, and, that my parents are like yeah. that. My dad and my stepmom. Yeah. I'm always Party. like, but it's also hard for me. I feel like I have subconsciously yep. taken that on because Mark will be like, "Babe, you don't really say that you love me very often." Like you don't really <laughs> say. I mean, and we all know Mark very well. Like well, that's a, such a Mark thing to say. And he was like, "But you could just look me in the eyes and be like, I love you." I love that dude I so like, much. <laughs> I was like, I could, and you know. It's so vulnerable. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I know. I know. He was like, I was like, you know, through my actions, I don't really have to look you like right in the eyes and say it, right? Like, <laughs> I also have problems doing it. Like, I can do it every day to my children. Like, my children, oh, I love you. I'm in love. Oh, you're just the best. Like, I can say it to my kids. But then even like to my husband, I'll be like, I love you, babe. Like, I'll do it really quick and, like, not really looking at him. And no wonder why he feels vulnerable. He's like, but do you actually love me? Because it doesn't really seem that way. Um, Wait, that's what's <laughs> funny about that, Teresa, is Mark and I are, like, looking into your guys' eyes. And I'm like, I love you, Eric. And Mark's like, I love you, Teresa. And you guys yes. are like, cool, that was really dramatic. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, take it easy. Um I, uh, my dad, my dad still, I just decided, because I know that my parents, you know, my parents are in their mid seventies. And when I say parents, um, I have my mom, I call her my mom. And then when I say parents, it's my stepmom and my dad. So like my parents are in their mid seventies and, um, I have been making such a point of trying to say I love you because I realize that in our conversations when you, we hang up the phone, we never say I love you. Um, so in the last four years, I was like, look, I would hate for them to pass away and I never push through the sort of uncomfortable feeling of just like telling them like how much they mean to me and how much they love me. So I have been practicing, actively really practicing. It's like working a muscle and just saying to my dad on the phone, like, love you, dad. And he'll be like, love you too. Like he'll say it, but it's still hard. And I can see it in his eyes and his face and he wells up and he's so, he feels so proud and so much love. I see the way he looks at the kids and, you know, his grandchildren and I feel the love. It's just the, the saying of it. Um, there's a bit of a blockage there, I think, in our family. And maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe it stemmed from the, you know, it's that Australian thing. Um, but also with my mom, she can say it to me every day, all day. She says, I'm the best thing that ever happened to her. And it's, um, it's so nice. So I, luckily I, I get both things. I get stuff from my parents and I get, you know, that, that softening and that gentleness, um, that does exist in me. I get that from my mom and then, kind of my business head from my dad. 
<laughs> it's a good combination. Eric, how you were just you were just starting to speak to um, your processing of grief. Like how oh, has that? Yeah, just that gone for you. I um, historically have not been great at it. I think. Well, let's define what that means. I think I'm really good at compartmentalizing grief and then proceeding to do whatever it is that it needs to be done next. And so if I look at like, you know, kind of the milestone tragic moments of my life, um, I'm incredibly efficient um, and nothing kind of, I remember finding out that my best friend in college died. I got the phone call, We we were filming Fired Up and anyone that's seen Fired Up, uh, we was a night shoot, and we were shooting an outdoor naked cheer. So I am literally <laughs> like in my dressing room, like trying to fit on a man thong, which is essentially just like you, it just covers just your junk, and then there's like a g-string in the back. And I got a call from one of my other good friends in college, and they were like, uh, "He died." And I remember being like, "Um." Uh, oh okay and like having literally like three minutes to process that as they banged on my trailer and then going out and shooting a 12 hour night scene that is incredibly funny um and you couldn't even tell and i took that as such for like a impressive badge of like mm-hmm. oh look at this skill set that i literally just lost one of the people that's most important to me in my life like played such a pivotal role um in all those years and then I went out and, and crushed scenes for 12 hours. And what I didn't realize until later is that it was such a disservice to me. It was such a disservice to him. And what I realized, and my mom's a chaplain. She's like a non-denominational, mm-hmm. amazing chaplain who fully believes in, like, if my philosophy about conflict is that you communicate through it and once everything's there, you can move through it. But for some reason, for for grief, for me, I just had such a, a different and, and I think failed approach to it. I also didn't mm-hmm. see a lot. I have, of, the, I have the same approach. You have the same approach? I have yeah. the same. Yeah. Everything you're saying is like, me too. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because the pivot comes at some point, which is like what I looked at as such an amazing ability. I now look at as, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just... I don't know if the word is elongating or burying or whatever that is. And Mm -hmm. so I find myself in moments of grief in unexpected times because it's always still there. So like you you read about, it's, it, it's so got me when Paul Walker got in that car accident. I don't know Paul Walker. I've met him once. (sighs) Yeah. He he was in his car and somebody else was driving and all of a sudden it's just gone. And I remember, Mm Hmm. I think that's so finite, so finite, but the pain of losing someone that I really loved erupted in that moment. Like I was just really sad for, I mean, obviously justifiable for the loss of somebody that has kids and was at the peak of his career. Um, and then when Dr. Goldberg died, um, I was meeting Sarah, we had two separate cars and we came to, to meet for, and I came on the corner and I could see immediately something was dreadfully wrong. And I was like, what's happening? And she's like, Goldberg died and that same switch kicked in which was like take care of the people you're with like I'm not going to process this myself just immediately step into like what does everybody else need in this moment like you know the kids and everything else and I realized I was sitting there and I started thinking about his two kids and the role that he played in so many lives knowing that as much as we thought that he was you know that Sarah was his favorite client and or his patient and and that he made her feel um, so special in that process. And I think he does have this incredible superpower when we are going into the unknown and charting the unknown, which is birth, right? That he always made Sarah feel like she could do anything and be the best version of herself. And that's all we can hope for in a partnership, right? In a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so the loss of him was extraordinary. And he was there when... I mean, we brought Wyatt with us um, when she had the pregnancy loss. And I remember like them doing the wand and holding Wyatt. And she's like, let me just grab the doctor. And I was like, oh, God. And Sarah turned white. And then the way that he handled that, just the beauty and elegance that he handled that. And the first thing he said to her was, this is not your fault. And of course, she knows it's not her fault. But of course, that still came up later on when 
she was dealing with the grief of it, but how he handled me, how he handled Wyatt. I remember standing outside the door for the DNC and him coming out and just giving me this really long hug afterwards. Like he was such an elegant and beautiful man. Mm -hmm. And I found myself at that point, like sliding into that thought as we sat there with my kids and I felt myself starting to cry and immediately was like, nope. Like that instinct of that Norwegian heritage yes. of like, you need to be the one that, that, um, isn't crying and is strong and helping everybody out. And I said, that's such a disservice as I looked at my son, who's such a, as you know, such a, mm. like a heart forward, a feeler. Like such a feeler. Yeah. And I said, I'm not going to do him that disservice. Um, I think it's okay for him to, to see his dad cry. See you. And, I, and just oh, tears. It's a gift. Yeah. I mean, I hope so. But tears, of course, then just are streaming down my face. And he just stared at me. Um, and he looked at me and of course he doesn't, you know, that's an, that's a something I don't know if he's seen at this point. No, he has, he's seen lots of tears of joy. Um, I think I'm really good mm -hmm. at showing that, but tears of sadness is the thing that I had to work on the most. And, um, he looked at me and I said, I, I think I need a heart hug. And he like jumped out of his chair and jumped into my lap and gave me like the huge hugs as, as I was, as I was crying. Ugh. Um, so that's something that I'm working on, like not, not, not talking about the last 12 years, 18 months. Like that's something mm. I work on every day because it's something Daily. that I, I think I lacked as a kid. And it's something I want my kids to have a balance in that. Like I want them to have the efficiency to be able to like navigate grief and pain and sadness and still function. But I also want them to allow themselves to go to that place so that they can heal from it. Otherwise, you just carry it. Um, and when you carry it, it's... Yeah, and it, it shows up in some other way. At some point, it'll catch up yeah. to you. I, I have that same soldier on yeah. thing. I think it's a survival. It certainly comes from my childhood. Oh, something feels hard. I'll push it down and I'll continue to be effective in my present life. And at some point, I think I always thought I would get to unpacking it, but then years go by and then it manifests yeah. in some other yeah. form. It comes out in some way. So um, that's a really beautiful thing that you've been able to observe and recognize that it's a part of, you know, your own conditioning and it's something that you want to work and, and work on and change and look at. Oh, here she is. She's back. Hi. He was just talking about his um his recent grief and – the ways in which he's been able to show up for that. Oh, I'm sure it was amazing. I heard none of it because I was um, completely frozen. I was just saying I re I relate to Eric and that idea of soldiering on through grief. Yes. Um, and that was the way I was conditioned. And I, I too, celebrated uh, the ability to be able to just move on when something hard happens. When one of my best friends died when I was 18, similar story. I was shooting a movie. I got the phone call. I was in shock for a moment. And I was like, wow, that's insane and then just showed up to set and just continued working um and it's he's actually through some work that I've done with a couple of mediums and therapists um I've been taking a look at that relationship and and what that really meant for me and to have that best friend in my life and how he died at such a young age at 18 and um yeah but Eric was saying that Wyatt was uh so beautifully like observant mm. of his grief and when he asked for that heart hug why it jumped up and I was saying what a beautiful gift mm -hmm. to feel like your children can see both mum process their feelings but dad as well I mean mm. in our household is balance the other it's like the imbalance is like Mark is the one that will show his emotions <laughs> and I'm like oh nothing phases me like, <laughs> so, um but that's really lovely. I just love that you shared that and and Wyatt, um, he like wears his emotions on his sleeve for sure. Yeah. He is like very, very um, emotionally, I guess, in tune. Is that mm -hmm. how, what you would call it? He's in it? touch. He's in touch with his emotions. Yeah. So is Bodhi. Bodhi's he, a feeler too. He feels too. it all very big. Like he feels. And you don't want to lose that. No. Because I'm sure that we, mm -hmm. at some point, we all start at some version of that until fear and shame is, is played into that about, you know, whatever that, 
whatever that is that that makes you judge your sadness? My fear is school. My fear is that at some point, you know, when the peer influence becomes stronger, that they'll learn to squash those feelings and hide that side of themselves. That's my only fear is five, ten years. I just I just hope that we can create an environment that they feel that even with their friends, they're able to be their truest selves and tap into all of those emotions because oh, it would be such a shame. It'd be such a shame to lose that. Well, I think that's where we can just our goal and that's why those important stories are so important is that we just have to model it. And when they have, you know, when they, they come back and tell us a story that this happened XYZ with this person. And I say that has nothing to do with you. That has to do everything with what it is that they're carrying and incapable of navigating, which is why they're leading with whatever that cycle of unkindness or fear or shame is. And I was like, you just do you, you know, let them, let them know Mm -hmm. that that usually comes from a place of pain. Um, I just hope that, I hope that that we're able to like everything else right if we give them the tools that you said earlier which is like to speak to that inner voice that they're able to navigate that and know themselves well enough to know that they're not dictated by the choices of others or the pressure of others Mm. this was such a beautiful talk i was just gonna say that this is a lot (laughs) this is a lot different than like our talks about like using vibrators on your nipples to get your labor going or like, yeah. can, I mean, we can oh, talk about how that much too. I've been bringing up poo. Or, or vibrators during sex or, uh, I don't those know. Are, those are the reasons. easy topics. This is the stuff that's hard for us. We're talking about grief I and sadness. I love this stuff. I love getting real. I love like just peeling <gasps> back too. the layers and like letting it all go. I love that you just frat boy that. You were like, I love getting real. I know. I just I love getting real, man. I really love it. Uh, I don't know what that accent was. It's like an but, American. Uh, there we go. American lacrosse it, player. Man. It was like a Duke lacrosse player. I really. This is the voice that I do a lot. I do this one a lot. That one's her. That's her American Valley Girl voice. <laughs> that was your Point Break, didn't you do that in Point Break? Wasn't that the voice you used in Point no, Break? No, I, I think I was an Aussie. Oh, you were? An Aussie oh, yeah, in Point were, Break. Um, <laughs> no, Eric, I want people to know where can they find you? What are you up to? He's not just an actor anymore. I saw you in, is it Never Been Kissed? Is that, oh no, was that, were you in that one? Probably not. Not another teen movie. It was that one. Not and you played the like, I played Paul Walker. The sort of Paul yeah. Walker. Yes. Yeah. And you looked, I mean, you look like him. And I remember seeing, I was like, what is Paul Walker? Oh, oh my gosh, it's actually this guy called Eric Christian Nelson. So I first saw you in Never, not another team. Why do I keep wanting to say Never Been Kissed? Were you in that movie? I wasn't even an actor. No, when that he was definitely yeah. not. I wish that was Heath Ledger. Okay, all right. No, was it Heath Ledger? Heath Ledger. Oh, there we go. No, no, that was Freddie Prince no, no, Jr. No, it wasn't. It was. Oh, we were blowing our, n- our blowing our nineties <laughs> uh, teen romantic comedies. Oh my Wait, god! Was it? Ten Wait, things was I hate about Freddie you. Prince? Ten things I hate about you is what I'm thinking. Oh yeah, that, that was Heath that Ledger. Was Ledger. Okay, and then okay, can't okay. hardly <laughs> wait. Who was that? That was like Evan oh, Embry. You're a bit oh, Evan my Embry-ish. Ethan. Ethan. Ethan Embry. Yeah. Oh, Ethan. <laughs> That's how we pronounce it. Evan. It's really weird. Maybe if we don't. Maybe oh, I made that up. Evan with a. Evan, Evan <laughs> Embry, he was so cute. But I saw so Eric cute. first in Not Another Teen Movie and it was so rad and it's so funny because yeah. I remember seeing you as I was probably 14 when I saw that movie. Oh, Easy Tiger. And I was easy. like, that guy's so funny. How fucking dare you. Because he's so old. <laughs> yeah, I think I was in college when I shot that movie. That was, yeah. Were yeah. you? Yeah, I was in college. Playing yeah. a, like You're- a 15-year-old? Well, wow. that's not as bad as Fired Up. Fired Up, I was 29 playing 17. <gasps> yeah. What? Yeah, I love it. Oh, you look so, You look so I had to shave though. twice a day. I literally just, it was actually, <laughs> we should end this on a, like a funny story, which is that Will Gluck, who did The Loop, which is where Sarah and I fell in love, um, where yeah. That's yeah. A, we could do a whole other podcast about how we first met. And maybe we should one day. Maybe we can. We'll do a part two. <laughs> um, but Will Gluck, who is the godfather of our daughter, and Pam Brady, who is the godmother of our son, like they did this show, We Fell in Love, and Will Gluck was doing another movie. He had just done Easy A, which is a great movie. Oh, I love that movie. And then he had the script about these two guys that go to cheer camp. It's the same concept as Wedding Crashers, except for cheer camp. And he said, hey, man, I don't think they're going to let me do this movie. We've been, you know, reading all these guys and they don't think it's funny. Will you come and just do the table read for me? 
Uh, I know that you're too old. Just come do the table read so they know it's funny. And then I can go off and cast this guy. And so I was like, sure, well, I'll come do your table read. So I went and did the table read for it for all of the Sony executives. And I was like, deuces, good luck with your movie. Peace is out. And I think I was going to go do like G.I. Joe or something. I don't know what the movie was I was supposed to go do. And uh, they called and they said they want you to do the movie. And I said, dude, I'm, I'm so old. We can't. We can't. I can't do this movie. And so we just kept turning it down. I was like, I'm literally 20. He's not even a senior in high school. He's a junior in high school. I can't play 17. No, I have right, a beard. Right. And we did a full bit, which I'm sure is someplace on the internet where I'm yelling at Will Gluck. It's like a, a fake Christian Bale rant. Um, but that's the reason I did that movie is because I did the table read and then they were like, just shave. So I have to shave in the morning. And then after lunch, I'd have to shave again um before we filmed in the afternoon but it ended up being a movie that you know i'm uh, you know i'm that movie really holds up i think it's really funny it's so good if you haven't seen fired up go see fired up and And eric you do have a baby face so i feel like that's why you you pulled it off you do have a little squidgy baby face a hundred percent no that's just that's just because we went to mexico and i gained 10 pounds in eight days (laughs) (laughs) we were all in mexico there was a there was a uh uh, a scale in like the middle of the men's locker room and we all got on. And we're like, this thing's broken. I was like, I can't. It's sitting yeah. on like eight pounds over. Like, there's no way. And then I came home and I was like, oh, no, I gained 10 pounds in eight days. That's what happens when you eat breakfast burritos every day for like eight days in a yeah. row. <laughs> That's what happened to me, too. Bacon wrapped bacon. Um, okay, Eric, tell us what's up next for you. And then we're going to let you go. Well, I was just going to tell everybody to check out um, the show that Eric is a producer on. It's called Woke on Hulu. You also have season 14 of NCIS LA that's coming out. Yep. You, what else? Tell us anything Tell else. Tell us. What else? So, no, I just, I started a production company, which has been such an amazing creative outlet. Um, and we have so many shows um, set up and sold all over uh, with the studio, one with FX and, and TBS and uh, Paramount Plus and Peacock and uh, two at Hulu. Like, it's been such an amazing time. And our whole philosophy is to try to find hyper-specific stories that have universal themes that at the end of the day make us feel less alone in the world um, by telling those those very specific stories. Um, and we've had a lot of really fun, creative success with it. Um, and so that's been a big part of, you know, if I have three jobs, first being, a, you know, a dad and a, a husband, second being NCISLA, and, and then the production company is another big part of that. And at some point, we'll be doing something with Teresa and Mark Weber. I was like, when are we going to be cast in one of your shows? Thank you very much. Sisters. We can be sisters. Uh, uh, also, I'd love to. You have an amazing Australian <laughs> accent. You, we could be Aussie uh, sisters. I could I could definitely try to copy. Still like, breastfeeding. Like, are you, are you are still you breastfeeding? breastfeeding? Hello, Sarah. Are you, how, how are the children? Are still breastfeeding? It's sort of British. <laughs> Isn't that a spot on of, of your mom? Hello, Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Are you still breastfeeding? Yeah. It's actually pretty good. <laughs> it's. I mean, listen, it is my favorite thing to do. Oh. Um, but Woke Season 2. So Woke Season 1, we shot pre-George Floyd. Season 2, we shot post. Um, and I think it's a really interesting POV on the Black experience in America uh, and done through a comedic dark lens. Uh with the brilliance mm-hmm. of this guy, Keith Knight, who was a cartoonist uh, and had a run-in with the cops himself 20 years ago in, in with SFPD. So if you haven't watched Woke, that would be... Season one is is really good. Season two is great. It's Sashir Zamata, who's incredible. Blake Anderson's from Workaholics. Lamorne Morris from uh, uh, The New Girl. T. Murph, who's a stand-up mm-hmm. comedian who kills it, which is such an amazing, talented cast and such a good show. So... People should definitely check that uh, out. And also, I'm doing a, a podcast very soon with uh, one of our collective friends. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, my God. I've heard about that. That's going to be amazing. I'm really excited about it. I, She's got a similar she's brain bloody, to, to us. She does. So we're gonna, it's going to be a free-for-all. We. I, have had, <laughs> I, I don't think I've epic. ever gotten in fights that lasted longer with anybody in my life. With anybody. I, at some point, I had to pull over. And I was like in a parking lot of the SLS hotel. That, I heard this. It, I think it was a three hour fight. Yeah, you had a big, he had a huge fight. And of course, it's both of us. Nobody raises their voice. It's all super like, you know, coming from a place know, of love. You guys are very, 
I would have been crying and screaming, and uh, I'm a very different creature than you two, which I I love it. But it was it was such wow. an because there's all and there was always progress too. Like the fight had like perpetual progress in in POVs. I can't wait to hear that on podcast. I hope you. Me I too. know what that thing was about. So I hope you bring <laughs> that up on your podcast, and I I'm sure it won't happen. But it would be. Well, we have we have a lot of those. We have a lot of contrasting POVs on a lot of things, which is why it's going to be that. healthy. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. But like everything we talked about, like there's such a mutual love and respect. Uh, she just wrote on Instagram. She was like, "Happy birthday to my bestie that's married to my other bestie." And I think that's such a good way of looking at like what that love and podcast will look like. Oh. I love it so much. I just wanted to say thank you for jumping on and being our first dad uh, podcast and and diving in with us, linking arms and uh, wearing your white flowy dress with us it so that very we good could uh, kumbaya around the campfire. I'm, I'm topless <laughs> in this. It's a podcast, so no one needs to see it. Um, but I should say too, just that how excited I am. I think that someone just said it recently that they read your book and it was like a hand on their back through their pregnancy. And mm. I think that if that's a hand on your back through pregnancy, this is a hand on your back through life. And I think that the two of you, you know, living your most authentic lives and being so vulnerable and honest and having these conversations is so important. And it's the same philosophy we have at Cloud9, which is that these conversations make us feel less alone and in the world and in our journey. And that mm. is a huge deal. And it's a gift to to everybody. So I, I thank you for doing the podcast and thank you for having Aww. me on and you know how much I love you both and and um, congratulations. We love ya, Papa Bear. Thank you. Mwah. Yeah, we're going to bring you on for the next uh, tarot card reading or, or medium episode so yes. we can see what happens when... <laughs> I mean, that's what you want, right? You want somebody that's like cross-examining <laughs> yes. a tarot card reader. Yes, we do. Teresa and I are like, yes. Oh, yeah. Tell we're us. Gonna, okay, tell us all that. We're like, bring it in, you know? Um, but I think it, it's fun to listen to both versions of that. So it'd be really fun to have you on if we ever do like a live medium reading or something like that. That would be yes. really cool. So we have, after every meeting, we have a, a uh, task list like a like what our walkaways uh -huh. are and Teresa your task yeah. list after this is to go find Mark to look him directly in the eye <laughs> and to say I love you and without an unwavering voice go I, I, I love, love you you <laughs> run away I, what's I amazing love, is that you. Teresa you are legitimately <laughs> like one of my favorite actresses like you are so versatile and <laughs> saying things that are impossible like you're giving incredibly <gasps> difficult dialogue and you're always truthful like if my philosophy for acting is you listen and you tell the truth like you are capable of mm -hmm. unbelievable acting but in this moment <laughs> where you're right. having to look Mark in the eye and just be like uh, I yeah, love yeah. you Love and I, you? Question mark. I Rob Burgundy. Really do that. I love you. Oh no! It brings me so much joy. It brings I me do, so much joy. I love joy. it so much. I just I love it. Do I have to say it? <laughs> oh, Give him a hug and, and I love hug you guys. this beautiful chip. I, I love you. Guys. you. Congrats. Oh, you Thank you guys. You were listening to the Mother, Mother Days. Days. Cue that us. music. You can find uh, us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> 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 <laughs>